This afternoon we want to talk about history and culture of Oman. I want to give you a very brief introduction to Oman since we are going to be there both tomorrow to Salala. And Salala is a beautiful city. Um, I'm sure that if you haven't been to Oman before or haven't studied it, you will be surprised by what you see. Oman has a strip of green where they do a lot of agriculture along the seacoast. And then as you move further in, there are areas of sort of desert and mountains before you get into the large desert, which is the, when you cross the border into Saudi Arabia on the north. Um, so we want to talk about that a little bit, especially I want to introduce you to uh, the Sultan Qaboos, who I've mentioned before, and we'll, we'll get into that. This is... Uh, tomorrow you're in Salala, and when we get back on board, we'll have two days before we get to Kassab. Kassab is in the Musandam Peninsula, which I will show to you. And we'll talk about Alexander the Great and Hellenism, because he affected all of the Middle East and Asia all the way over through India. Then we will talk about the Crusades, and finally, history, conflict, and culture in the Middle East. But today, um, and I'll keep giving you this so that you have a chance to write it down. I see a lot of people taking pictures of it. Uh, we'll. Feel free to go to that site for any of these talks or any of the other talks I've done that you're interested in. Here we're looking at the Arabian Peninsula. Of course, the majority of the Arabian Peninsula now is called Saudi Arabia, named after the family Saud, Abdulaziz ibn Saud, in the 1920s, took over the Hejaz, the area along the coast here that includes Mecca and Medina, and he controlled uh, south of the protectorates, uh, which was Transjordan and Iraq were British protectorates, south and the only parts of the Arabian Peninsula that are not, not part of Saudi Arabia are Yemen, where we're just off of right now, Oman, which we're gonna talk about, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and or Qatar as it's sometimes pronounced, and Bahrain, and then Kuwait. Um, this, this is, well, I've got the big map up here, this is Salalah, that's the first place we're going to be stopping. And it is obviously fairly close to Yemen. The, uh, the capital is Muscat, up here on the, the opposite end. We are going to be going to Kassab, the Musandam Peninsula, the area that is closest to Iran. It's only about six miles across the Straits of Hormuz there. Straits of Hormuz uh, and the, is the entrance to the Persian Gulf. You've heard about that on the news, especially during the Iraq War and things of that sort. Uh, those, those terms are used a lot. The Gulf of Oman, Oman, the Straits of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf. But the Musandam Peninsula, which belongs to Oman, interestingly, is, is, is not contiguous. It's not connected to the rest of Oman. The United Arab Emirates actually cuts it off, but it is still part of Oman, even though it's not connected to it. So that's where we're headed. Again, a different map. This one's larger. Salala down here. I had people asking me uh, earlier about the empty quarter. Where is the empty quarter? Well, other than, the, you'll notice that all of the towns are along the along here. When you get out into the desert, and then the mountains, because it has both deserts and mountains, you in, uh, enter a place that is just so inhospitable, it's called the empty quarter. Uh, there's nothing there, and so between there and up into Saudi Arabia, uh, it is quite inhospitable. But as you'll see tomorrow in Salala, it's quite lovely, and you'll have a chance to, to visit there. So. Oman is uh, the Qajar da Kanjar Dagger I'll talk about in a few minutes. You will have an opportunity, if you wish to take the tour, the bizarre tour, and, and uh, this is Job, as I mentioned before, Job of the Bible Job. It's believed that the book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Hebrew Bible, even older than, than the, the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. And um, if you wish, you can visit, and we're told that's him right there you know this is job and then this is the beautiful mosque the, the sultan's mosque that you'll have a chance to visit as well and go in uh, this was built by the sultan Qaboos. Um, there are 3.8 million people in oman it's 309,000 square kilometers it is a sultanate which means it's not just a monarchy i mean we have a lot of monarchies britain is a monarchy but the queen is, does not have very much governmental power. Uh, they, she has respect and people will listen to her, but it is the parliament, the prime minister, that has the power. Not so in Oman. Oman is a sultanate, which means the sultan of Oman um, has absolute authority. He can appoint people to offices, any offices in the government. He can, by fiat, meaning just by his own word, 
He can initiate laws. He can uh, set some laws aside. This has led to um, a lot of people expressing concern that it's not a free society. Well, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, when his father was in charge, that clearly was a problem. But with the Sultan Qaboos, who came in 1970 through a house coup, um, he has demonstrated that his, his desire, his heart's passion, is to do what's in the best interest of his people. I'm sure they run into problems with it being an absolute monarchy, but uh, as the Sultanate. But uh, at the same time, the people love him. He had um, serious health problems when uh, not too long ago. He spent several months in Germany. When last time we were here, the people in Oman were really worried about him. They worried about him constantly because he is much beloved. Um, and so we'll talk about succession and things in a few minutes. As I told you, the Musandam Peninsula up here is cut off. This is part of the United Arab Emirates, but we'll go to Kassab. And then afterwards, we'll come around the corner and go down to Dubai. This is the Straits of Hormuz that I showed you a second ago, Gulf of Oman, Oman Straits of Hormuz, and then the Persian Gulf. So um, you have an opportunity to see the mosque and to go see Job. Um, so I think we're going to try to go on that trip. Um, one of the things that they've discovered here in Oman are some of the oldest human uh, habitations in history. They, this location here at Al Ain, they have found clearly what are human dwellings built out of stone that they believe are at least 106,000 years old. It's believed that what happened in ancient, very ancient times, this is a long time before um, any written history or anything of that sort, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, I'm sorry, not Gulf of Aqaba, the uh, Red Sea was much lower than it is now. And so you will remember the captain announced we went through the Bab al Mindeb, which is the narrowest place between the corner of Yemen and the countries across in Africa, Djibouti particularly. And it's a very narrow area. It's believed that the Red Sea was so much lower in very ancient times that uh, it was probably only a matter of a few miles across that strait and that it was fairly shallow. So that it's some, much of it could have been weighted, certainly they could have just you know, floated across on a log or whatever. Africa, somewhere just over 100,000 years ago, based upon the uh, evidence we have from plant life and whatnot, that it went through terrible droughts. At the same time, there was an increase, this part of the world, um, Yemen, Oman, southern Saudi Arabia, was much wetter then. It wasn't as dry, there was more vegetation, it was much more hospitable than it is today. So they believe that humanity, early humanity over 100,000 years ago, crossed over from Africa, the original birthplace of human beings as we know them, crossed over at probably the Bab al Mandeb or elsewhere. And so they came right through this area, Yemen and Oman, in order to be able to spread out into Europe, into Asia, into other areas. So this is where humanity, according to scientists, uh, came from. And we have evidence of over 100,000 year old dwellings in Oman from this migration of people. As you've seen this picture several times, in the early 600s, uh, 610 approximately, when he was 39 or 40 years old, Muhammad started having visions and started, uh, he believed, his wife believed him, he believed he was a prophet called to reintroduce the right belief in God, the one God, Allah. And one of the very first places that came to accept his message was in uh, Oman. They're very proud of the fact I don't have that other slide. They're very proud of the fact that they were some of the earliest believers. In fact, today they practice a unique kind of Islam in Oman. It's called Ibadi Islam. They claim it is even older than Shia or Sunni because it was developed after the second of the Rashidun Calif uh, Caliphs, after first Abu Bakr, who succeeded Muhammad, and then Omar. The third one was Uthman. Well, in between Umar and Uthman, before Ali and the controversy of real succession created such a rift, they claimed that they had come to believe. And Ibadi has some different theological beliefs as well. They don't believe the Quran has always existed in heaven, as the rest of Islam does. They don't believe there has to be one leader, one caliph, 
who controls all of Islam. They believe different countries can elect different leaders if there's not one leader that's appropriate for it. Um, and they have a number of other differences in terms of how they interpret their faith. But they are uh, entirely Islamic. At one time, Oman, which was called Muscat and Oman until 1970, was a major power in the region. You may say Oman. I never heard of Oman until I came on this trip. In the 17th century, Oman was a major competitor to both the Portuguese and the British for control of trade in the Indian Ocean, in the Persian Gulf, in the entire region. There was a period of time up through the 19th century when they controlled much of the land across the Persian Gulf in Iran and even parts of Iraq. At one time, they were the Sultanate of Muscat, Oman, and Zanzibar. You know where Zanzibar is? Yes. Okay, yes. Zanzibar is down in Africa. It's basically the coastline around Tanzania. There are islands associated with it. There's also coastal areas. They controlled all of that. Uh, the Zanzibar part, unfortunately, was primarily because of slave trade. They became very, very wealthy as a country from African slave trade. But they were always a maritime country. They were a major competitor to the countries that we think of as being major powers down through history. And so when you, if you travel around Oman, which you will not have much opportunity to do this time, unless you miss the boat uh, you know, tomorrow, <laughs> that you will find these fortresses. Because it was a time when they, their uh, ports were fortified. They were, um, the com competition between Portugal and Britain and Oman was so significant that there was always a threat of war. And so they, you'll find beautiful forts they were always in a position to defend themselves. Um, this is the Sultan's Palace in Zanzibar. At one point, Zanzibar, again, down uh, Africa way, was the capital, and the Sult this was the primary Sultan's residence. They no longer own the property down in, in Zanzibar in Africa, but uh, it was a major center for them at one time. Oman has a unique culture. For one thing, because they had different areas including parts of Iran and Iraq, parts of Africa that they controlled in addition to the areas here. Uh, their culture is really a mix of many different things, much more so than a lot of the other countries in the Middle East. Um, they are, Omanis tend to be um, very fairly fair compared to some other people. That's not universally true. They are uh, brilliantly artistic. There are aspects of the Omani culture that's very much like the rest of the Middle East, camels and that sort of thing. But they also have very particular and distinctive kind of clothing and things of that sort. This man is wearing uh, a dishdasha. They wear dishdashas all in, throughout this whole area, but the dishdashas that the Omanis wear are fairly distinctive. You might be able to see he's got a, a cord that's attached to his dishdasha that's got a, a little fringe on the end of it. Um, this is called a foraka. And they, historically, they would take the foraka and dip it in perfume. And whenever they found something, you know, something was unpleasant to smell, and I've actually seen them do that uh, in Oman, they would take the foraka and hold it up to their nose, like what used to be called a nose game in, uh, in Britain, for instance. And they would, that's, that's fairly distinctive to them. You will notice that he is carrying a dagger. I'll show you other images. This is a kanjar dagger. This is the, the emblem of the Omani people. Um, this is typical of male Omani dress. They sometimes will wear a cloak over that. It's either black or beige, called a bisht. Then for hats, there's a very distinctive sort of pillbox hat that they wear. There's two kinds of them. One is called a musar and one is called a kuma. If you're fortunate, you, I mean, you'll find them everywhere. I have one at home. I thought about bringing it, but then I always pack too much anyway. Um, and I have a dishtasha, and I have a whole, the whole nine yards. But the, the hats, and then they will take a kafia, for instance, they'll put the hat on first, put the kafia over it, so it gives it a very distinct structure. Uh, our guide last time showed us how that all worked, and so maybe you'll get the opportunity to see that tomorrow as well. We had a wonderful guide last time. We'll never, we still quote it sometimes. Uh, I remember when we came out of the port, and we were beginning to drive out to see some things, there was this industrial factory thing over it, and he said, over there, that's our ice cream factory. No, wait, not ice cream. That's cement, that's a cement factory. <laughs> and he was just hilarious, and he was so sort of quiet and modest, and yet he was very funny as well. The children are beautiful, as they are in much of this part of the world, and women tend to dress in very colorful kinds of clothing. 
They also will use the typical uh, Islamic dress. They will wear a, a bayas. There are some places in Oman where they will wear burqas, which cover everything. Sometimes they just wear the hijab, you know, the head wrap. One of the things that's been interesting about the history of Oman is that frequently it has been kind of broken up into two. The Sultan, and there has been a Sultan around for hundreds and hundreds of years, would control Muscat and the cities of the coast. All of the interior would be controlled by the, the lead Imam of the Abadi Muslim faith. And at various times, the Imam, the, the Islamic Imam, and the Sultan would be at war with each other in, for control. The Imam felt like as the religious leader, he had the authority to control the whole country. The Sultan felt like as the political leader, he didn't have to, he shouldn't be told what to do by the Imam. That's gone back and forth. It's only in the last 45 years, 47 years, under the current uh, Sultan Qaboos, that that has all ended. He dealt with all of that early on in his regime. But he, up through his father's reign to 1970, they still had conflict between the religious leader and the political leader in the country. This is the beautiful Kanjar dagger. They are usually in silver. Sometimes you'll get sto you know, precious stones in them. I would love to have one of these, but I can't imagine how I would explain it to security in the airport. Um, <laughs> And if I tried to ship it, I'm sure somebody, some Mexican um, you know, customs official would end up with a beautiful thing to hang on his wall. So, but the Conjar dagger is very much a symbol of the sort of military pride and the, the historical legacy of the Omanis. So you will definitely see these if you leave the boat at all uh, tomorrow. Um, because of the fact that they have the various port cities, and at one point, Muscat, the capital of Oman, was the number one seaport in all of the India Ocean. It's a, it was a major deal. They have been a seafaring people forever, as long as there have been boats. This is the traditional, they've got several different kinds of boats that are commonly built here, but as shipbuilders, this is the most common kind. It's called a dhow. It's a very efficient um, way to get around. You have the opportunity when we go to Kassab, if you wish, to take a Dow cruise of one of the fjords. Oman is sometimes called the, um, the Norway of the Middle East because it has these extraordinary fjords that lead back into the mountains, very rugged and rocky and desert looking mountains, but they have these fjords that go back into them. And you'll have a chance to ride on a Dow and have, uh, a, have a meal on a Dow if, in Kassab if you wish to do that. And it, like the dagger, has become a symbol of Oman because of their long history in seafaring. This man is Saeed bin Taimur. He was the Sultan of Muscat and Oman, which is what it was called until 1970. He ruled from 1932 to 1970. He's been called the last feudal mon monarch of Arabia. He famously said, keep the dogs hungry and they will follow you. Do you sort of get the idea of what kind of guy he was? During his time, the whole country had three primary schools no secondary education of any kind. There were only a thousand students in the whole country, and all of them in elementary school. Um, if, you, if any child wanted, or their parents wanted them to have any higher education, they had to illegally sneak out of the country and know they could never come back. So they had to be willing to accept exile under Saeed bin Taimur. And he, it, it's astonishing, the restrictions. Everything was outlawed under him. You could not build any new houses. You could not repair the house you lived in. You could not um, put in a lavatory. If, you need, you know, if your plumbing was messed up, you couldn't fix it. You couldn't add anything. You could not install a gas stove. You couldn't cultivate any new land. You could not buy a car. None of that was allowed. You couldn't, and this is until 1970, you couldn't smoke in public. There were no movies. You couldn't go to the movies. You could not play musical instruments. In fact, there had been a military band in Oman, and the Sultan one day decided he didn't like it, so they threw all the instruments in the ocean. There were no musical instruments, at least not that anybody knew about. Um, the city gates were closed three hours after sunset, and no one was allowed in or out. Uh, there were no visitors to the country. Even sailors aboard ships were not allowed to leave their ships if they came into port. So there were no foreigners. The only reason a foreigner could come in is that they had personal permission by the Sultan, which he almost never gave. 
there was you could not travel across the country if you lived in, you know in a city along the coast you couldn't travel inland or vice versa you had to stay where you were and the country was primarily uh, developed by slaves they continued to have a lot of slaves until the 19 until 1970 we think human slavery ended a long time ago right not here um, they had amongst the highest infant mortality rate in the world 90% of the people suffer from malaria. There was rampant uh, tuberculosis, trachoma, rampant malnutrition. Um, their gross national product at that time was $100 million a year. They have oil, and they had oil back then. Now, they're not a huge producer of oil. They're 25th in the world, but they had enough oil. There was no reason they could develop it. The only reason that they did not do more to care for the people is that this man, Saeed bin Tamur was paranoid that if he gave people anything, then his position would be taken away from him. Um, and even his own son, his son was allowed to leave the country and he studied in India and then went to Sandhurst, the military academy in Britain. And after Sandhurst, he served in the British Army for a while. He um, served in Germany for the British Army. But when he returned back to Oman, his father put him under what amounted to house arrest. He could not leave the palace for years. He was allowed all the books he wanted, all of the records he wanted, but no one could see him. He could not leave, and he was an adult. So in 1970, his son, Kabus, uh, launched a house coup and overthrew his father. His father was not hurt. He was sent into exile. Uh, in Britain, he lived at the Dorchester Hotel for several years before he died, but he died in Britain. Later on, his son has, has he was buried in Britain, his son repatriated his body back to Oman and actually buried him with honors, even though I don't think anybody really believed he deserved it. This is the current Sultan, Kabus bin Said al Said. He has been the Sultan of Oman since 1970 up until the present, and um, again, for six years, he was a prisoner in the palace. And when he, the first thing he did when he, and when he took over, uh, Oman was rife with civil war uh, between the followers of the Imam and those who wanted to support the Sultan, so the religious and government side. There were wars going on with Yemen because of uh, cross border sorts of things. The first thing that Kabus did when he took over was he tr visited the whole country within a few days of becoming the Sultan. And most of these people had never seen they're salted before that. And if they had, it had been a long time ago. And so he saw everyone. He told the people involved in the Civil War, he immediately began to provide um, food for people. He started right away providing uh, support in areas. He promised that he would give amnesty to anyone who had fought against, either from Yemen that had fought against the uh, Oman, or anybody involved in the Civil War. He provided amnesty, and more and more, it was it, people began to be aware of the fact that he was giving them all the things they wanted. He was providing food, he was providing medical care. He was doing everything in his power to care for the people. And so the people who were against him, the rebels, all of a sudden said, why should we be fighting? He's given us everything we want. And so the wars that they were involved in just faded away very quickly. Now there continued to be some problems, and he dealt with them pretty sternly with the support of Britain and uh, the Shah of Iran and, and the president, the uh, King of Jordan, those who refused to accept the amnesty and stop the war, he clamped down on them in order to be able to bring peace. And he did bring peace in very significant ways. Probably the best way I can describe the impact that he has had is between 1970, which I've told you what it was like then, until um, 2015, well, actually 2010, in 2010, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, named Oman the most improved country from a development perspective of any in the world over the previous 40 years. Right now, because of Sultan Qaboos, um, he, well, one thing, he loves classical music. The orchestra that he sponsors, it's a young, a children's or a young people's orchestra, Young people in schools as like elementary school age that are found to have musical talent, they're given an education, they're provided uh, support for them and their families, they're brought up to be able to contribute to this internationally renowned symphony, 
He loves classical music. Of course, records is one of the few things that he had when he was on 60 years of house arrest. So the world's most improved country, they went from $100 million as the total GDP in 1970 to $69.83 billion by 2015. Education, where they had had three primary schools, no secondary education, and only 1,000 students, they now have 1,000 state schools, 650,000 students, and major universities that are very highly thought of. Um, and they have, uh, literacy is close to 95% literacy now. Obviously that wasn't the case in 1970. In terms of stability, previously they had perpetual insurrection, it's now listed as the 59th most peaceful country in the world. Medical care, they had the world's highest infant mortality rate, 90% of the people had malaria, most were malnourished, they had 99% of the people now have access to medical care that is provided by the government. And in fact, um, when, we, when you travel, if you, if you take the Dow Cruise, for instance, in uh, Kassab, you're sailing out in an area in these fi this fjord, and it's obviously very rugged territory. If you look up on the hillsides, you're likely to see electrical wires. He provided electrical, um, electrical utility to the whole country, even places that are unbelievably remote. The chill, and you, as you cruise up here, you'll see these little pockets of villages that are, you know, heck and gone from Cartagena. They're just, it's a long way from anything. The children there are, uh, they have boats that pick them up and take them to school. They have medical helicopters that will come in and evacuate anybody who has a medical problem. They can't, they, they can't put doctors in all these little tiny gatherings of people, but they have provided so that everyone has medical care, everyone has access to education, all young people have access to education. He's provided electricity and clean water to the whole country, even areas that are form formidably remote, all right? Pre-1970, no movie theaters, radio, or TV stations, no playing of musical instruments, no one was supposed to wear eyeglasses, at least certainly not where the Sultan could see them. No travel in, out, or around the country, no visitors. You were forbidden to build new houses, repair old houses, forbidden to install a lavatory or a gas stove, forbidden to cultivate new land, forbidden to buy a car without the Sultan's permission, and on and on and on. Pretty much, there was nothing that was not forbidden. And now, it's an extraordinarily developed and health, healthy country, all because of one man. Again, one of the things about when you have absolute power, you can use it in different ways. His father used it in one way, and he went exactly the opposite direction. He has used the resources of the country and his absolute authority to really provide for the people in his country in an extraordinary way. You see why I said he's like the coolest guy in the whole world? There is a serious problem because obviously he's getting older. He's the uh, longest uh, serving leader within the whole of the Middle Eastern region from 1970 until now. He has not been in good health. He has previously been married, but is no longer married. He does not have an heir, and they've been very worried about what are they gonna do for an heir? You know, how are they gonna continue this? He has apparently uh, written his recommendation for his heir. He doesn't want to announce it because he feels like that would create conflict. But he's written it down, sealed it in an envelope, given it to the, one of the head ministers. He, by the way, he created a bicameral parliament. He, women serve in the parliament now. Now, women are still restricted in many ways because it is a very conservative Islamic country. But uh, he, has, he has significantly opened up opportunities for women, minorities, people who previously were considered kind of untouchables in the country. Um, and yet he, he has absolute authority. He can always over overrule. He can veto whatever, but he tends not to. So with the bicameral government and with the council of ministers that are in place, he has written the name of who he wants to be a successor. And when he dies, they will open that letter and whoever he's recommended, the Council of Ministers will vote on whether they accept that or they have the power at that point to, to have someone else be his heir because he does not have a blood heir. So, um, and it's been, you know, it's, it's, they're really kind of concerned about what's gonna happen because he has been the spine, you know, the focal point of everything that has made this country change in the last um, 40, 47 years now. This is the Al Alam Palace in Old Muscat. Um, you know, the, the Sultan lived pretty well, even though prior to Qaboos, the country was in pretty bad shape. This is Qaboos University and Al Naud. Again, they have a number of very modern universities in Salala, in uh, several of the uh, 
cities. Um, Nazawi has a major university in it. So there is higher education available in the country now. And if somebody wishes to go outside, they're not prevented from doing so. Obviously, cruise boats are showing up in Oman, so they don't have a problem with visitors anymore. So this, again, is the map. We are going to Salala down here in the corner. Then we will cruise the whole distance around past Muscat here up to Kassab on the Musandam Peninsula. And then after a day there, we will come down to Dubai. So I got a long way. I've still got three talks to give you throughout that time. So any questions about Oman? Yes. Uh, can you explain why there is it's not contiguous? Yeah, why why is the uh, the uh, the peninsula, the Musanda Peninsula, separated? I don't really know. I probably should find out. I mean, it's not the only place in the world. In, in fact, if we lived in Washington State, and there's a place called Point Roberts that belongs to Washington State, it's part of the United States, but you have to go through Canada to get there. You know, it's separated. So that sort of thing is is not. Yes. Okay. Good. during the formation of the United Arab Emirates. And it's called the United Arab Emirates because there are, I think it's seven emirs or princes, each of which controls an area and they have joined together in one government. That's why it's the United Arab Emirates. There is an emir of Dubai and an emir of Abu, Abu Dhabi, etc. And the, um, and I was not aware of that, thank you. That when United Arab Emirates were formed, they gave people the right to vote as to whether they wanted to stay with Oman or whether they wanted to go in UAE. And Kassab, the Musandam Peninsula, voted to stay with Oman, but the areas in between decided to go with the UAE. So, thank you for that information. I was not aware of that. Other questions? Yes? How do you get the dagger out of the sheath, and how do you use it? <laughs> how do you get the dagger out of the sheath, and how do you use it? It actually comes out very smoothly. I mean, it's it looks like it's an L-shaped, how do you call it? But it just sort of, sort of slides out. Um, and how you use it, I have used one, and I'm not telling. <laughs> okay. oh. uh, they're beautiful. <laughs> They're beautiful things, um, but how you use it depends upon what you want to use it on, I guess. Yes? Are the Ibadis considered heretics by other uh, parts of uh, Are the Ibadis considered heretics by other parts of Islam? Well, they're a large enough body, because they're not only in Oman. There are, there are um, Ibadi Muslims in a few other places. It's just it's by far the largest block. But they're, they clearly disagree with the Ibadi theology, the fact that they don't believe that Ibadi does not believe that the Quran has always existed, but rather that it was written at one point. They, got, they still believe God gave it, but that it was written down at one point. The idea that the, the uh, Shia would not agree with them because they don't believe there should be one leader over all of Islam, and that's a major principle in the Shia faith, that there is one God-anointed Imam like the Ayatollah Khomeini was, that's why that was such a big deal when he came back from Iran, that is supposed to be the voice of God for the people. So there are some very distinct differences. They don't have any conflict. In fact, one of the things that Oman has been successful in doing that nobody else has been successful in doing is they have maintained relationships with every other country in the, in the Persian Gulf area, both Iraq and Iran. Even though they participated with a, with a force in the uh, the efforts in the Iraq war, the the united efforts by the U.S. and Britain and everything else, they actually provided some troops to that and still were able to maintain good relations with the government of Iraq. So um, they, they get along with everybody. Iran, Iraq, they get along with Sunnis, they get along with Muslims. Part of that is probably because Ibadi is very well known for being non-militant. They are, they are very low-key about stuff. And they say, this is what we believe, but that's okay if you don't agree. And so they're not perceived, I don't think, as a threat. They're not trying to proselytize other people into their version of Islam, and they are very tolerant. Ibadi in, in Oman are known for significant toleration, and so they would not, that's probably why they don't really have a problem with the other branches. Yes? Right. 
So the Omanis, during times of conflict, with, even between other countries, they're seen as diplomats. They're seen as the ones that help bring, bring the people to the table and, and get along because they're, they are very tolerant and they are not aggressive with their own views and they've managed to get along with everybody um, in, again, for the last 40 years since uh, they had a lot of problems under Caboose's father, but now they get along very well. And the, the fact that they're seen as diplomatic envoys by other countries uh, is, a, is a positive. Yes? Uh, what happened with the slaves? Did they free them all? And were they from their own country? or? Well, um, most of them would have been African slaves. And the African slave trade was one of the ways that Oman, in the 17th to 19th century, they were very wealthy. A lot of that came from the slave trade, because that's why they had possessions down in Africa, Zanzibar, etc. But um, they, there are no slaves now, and Caboose, I, I don't know the particulars of it, but, but Caboose would have ended slavery in this country at some point, probably very early on. Oh. But um, in fact, the uh, time war of his father uh, was so paranoid, he would only allow his closest slaves to be around him. Nobody else was allowed around him. Um, but slavery was done away with. That's no longer an issue. And people think that there isn't slavery in the world today. Some estimates are that 10% of the population of the whole planet are still slaves. If you go into parts of Africa, West Africa, for instance, for more remote areas, it's believed that 10% of the population of those countries may still be slaves. Um, it's not that rare, and yet we tend to think, and we, we talk in terms of human trafficking, which is horrendous, it's a huge problem, but we don't realize that this is so institutionalized in some of the countries of the world that slavery is still very, very common. Other questions? Yes. Maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but our, our son Muscat is the name of our, our favorite grape. Okay, Muscat grape, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so any relation? I'm not aware of any relation between Muscat grapes and the, you know, I like a good dessert wine too, uh, in the city of Muscat. There may have been because of the trade that has that has happened through Oman at one point, but I'm not aware of any connection. So Is there a hand here? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. What happened to his wife? Um, his wife is still alive. She's fine. He didn't. Um, how do I put this? What's that? Consummate. Yeah, they. Um, there have. He's so well loved, and I in no way mean this as a as a problem. But there have been questions about his sexual orientation, and that may be why he and his wife, even when they were together, they lived separately, and then finally they they separated. Okay. Who cares? You know, the people love him and don't dare. And we actually, one of the previous speakers, when we had the Egypt College Report, she said something about that. And we had guests asking Omanis, so is it true that the Sultan is gay? We don't know that. Don't ask that. If so, don't get back on the boat. Okay, just kidding. Just kidding about the last part. The first part, I'm serious. Yes. Yes. Question? What would it be like if we, if they're, if they're so diplomatic and tolerant, if you left and you walked around on your own without a tour guide? I'm not aware of any restrictions in that regard no. uh, in Oman. No. If somebody else knows something, I no, don't. You can go where you want. Yeah, you can go wherever you want. Yeah. Um, they are very open now, and I, I think that from what I can tell, and this is true, it's frequently true with conservative, fairly conservative. And interestingly enough, while they're fairly conservative in their own faith, they're fairly moderate, or they're very moderate, in terms of how they deal with people who are not Ibadi, or even not Islamic. And so, um, you know, you'd still want to have some, be, be fairly conservative, particularly as a woman uh, walking around, but I don't think there's any, there's no reason you can't, and I don't think you need to worry about your safety. I mean, anytime you're in a city, you have to have some sense about that, but um, these cities are probably less dangerous than most of the cities you come from. Okay, yes? The biggest change in their rise in GDP is that uh, Caboose, was, I mean, he developed other industry as well. Um, he has educated the people more so that they're more productive. He has provided them more resources. But the biggest thing is that he knew all the time that his father was not taking advantage of the oil that they have, even though they're only 25th in oil development. And so he has been very efficient in developing the oil industries. He has created partnerships with other countries so that they generate more income for his people. So the jump from 100 million to billions 
in GDP, much of that's because of oil, but much of it's because he simply has, has made the country more efficient. He has introduced other kinds of industry. Tourism is a factor for them now, where of course it, it, it would not have been previously. Nobody could come. So all of those are factors. But the oil is the biggest single income they have, even though they're not a massive oil producer. Thank you all very much. Enjoy Salala tomorrow, and we will be back with you in two days.